This is the Cambridge Assessment International Education, Cambridge IGCSE, November 2019 examination in English as a second language. Paper 4. Listening. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you're all ready. Here is the exam. Exercise 1. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words or a number for each answer. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. What kind of festival is the girl going to? B. What work will the girl do at the festival? What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to the flower festival with my parents. You're going to the music festival then, aren't you? I heard they've got some fantastic bands this year and are expecting thousands of visitors. Yes, that's right. My friend's father is organising the event, so we've got free tickets. Lucky you. Yes, but we've both got to help. My friend's got to check tickets and he's asked me to take photos, but I don't mind doing that. What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to the flower festival with my parents. You're going to the music festival then, aren't you? I heard they've got some fantastic bands this year and are expecting thousands of visitors. Yes, that's right. My friend's father is organising the event, so we've got free tickets. Lucky you. Yes, but we've both got to help. My friend's got to check tickets and he's asked me to take photos, but I don't mind doing that. Question 2. A. What surprised the man about the exhibits? B. What did the man buy? Was the exhibition interesting, Jack? Sure. There were lots of paintings and sculptures, all created by local artists in the course of the last year. Interesting. Yes. The variety of exhibits was greater than I'd expected. The prices were very high, of course, but they always are in that gallery. Were you tempted to buy anything? Well, there was a beautiful statue of a little dog that I'd have loved, but it was quite expensive, so I just got a poster in the end. I must show you sometime. Was the exhibition interesting, Jack? Sure. There were lots of paintings and sculptures, all created by local artists in the course of the last year. Interesting. Yes. The variety of exhibits was greater than I'd expected. The prices were very high, of course, but they always are in that gallery. Were you tempted to buy anything? Well, there was a beautiful statue of a little dog that I'd have loved, but it was quite expensive, so I just got a poster in the end. I must show you sometime. Question 3. A. Which type of rubbish is most common on Hilton Island's beaches? B. How many pieces of rubbish were found on the island last year? In this program, we'll be talking about Hilton Island. No one lives there, and it is over 5,000 kilometres from anywhere. Despite this remote location, the island's lovely beaches are covered with soft drink cans and other rubbish. Most frequent of all are plastic bags, though bottles and tyres are also common. Researchers say that there are as many as 4,500 pieces per square metre, and they discovered 38 million items of waste over the last 12 months. 
The rubbish has all been carried there by a powerful ocean current. This beautiful island has become one of the most polluted places on Earth. In this program, we'll be talking about Hilton Island. No one lives there, and it is over 5,000 kilometers from anywhere. Despite this remote location, the island's lovely beaches are covered with soft drink cans and other rubbish. Most frequent of all are plastic bags, though bottles and tyres are also common. Researchers say that there are as many as 4,500 pieces per square metre, and they discovered 38 million items of waste over the last 12 months. The rubbish has all been carried there by a powerful ocean current. This beautiful island has become one of the most polluted places on Earth. Question 4. A. What do many people say they find hard to get enough of? B. What is the purpose of the exercises at the start of the new classes? I heard an interesting thing on the news yesterday. Oh yes? Apparently more and more people complain that they lack sleep. Parents particularly say that what with work and children, they can't possibly get the recommended eight hours. So, a chain of fitness clubs has had the idea of offering special classes. These consist of 15 minutes of exercises to relax people, followed by 45 minutes lying on a mat covered by a blanket. So is it available in all their clubs? Well, they're trying it out in one place now, but we'll introduce it elsewhere if it's popular. I heard an interesting thing on the news yesterday. Oh yes? Apparently more and more people complain that they lack sleep. Parents particularly say that what with work and children, they can't possibly get the recommended eight hours. So a chain of fitness clubs has had the idea of offering special classes. These consist of 15 minutes of exercises to relax people, followed by 45 minutes lying on a mat covered by a blanket. So is it available in all their clubs? Well, they're trying it out in one place now, but we'll introduce it elsewhere if it's popular. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment you will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 2. You will hear a student talking about a science project she has done. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one word only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. This term in science, we've all had to choose an inventor or invention to do a project on. I decided to do mine about a prize-winning portable fridge that I'd heard mentioned on the radio. Then I went on the internet and discovered a lot more about the fridge and the person who invented it, 22-year-old Will Broadway. You might think that Will was motivated by the desire to keep drinks cool on sunny summer picnics, but that wasn't the case. His intention was to find a way of preventing medicines from getting too warm when they had to be transported in hot climates. It's been claimed that by making this possible, his invention could help to save the lives of 1.5 million people across the world. Will had just finished a degree in industrial design and technology. A study trip to Cambodia had made him aware of the difficulties that the heat caused. He saw people having to carry so much ice to keep things fresh when they needed to travel somewhere and decided that there had to be a better solution to the problem, but it was only when he was on holiday in Mexico that he came up with the actual invention. How does the device work? It is based on a process that was actually invented by Einstein in 1906. It involves heating a chemical called ammonia with water in one section of the fridge to create a gas which is then released into the main section when cooling is required. It can keep items at a steady temperature of between 2 and 8 degrees for up to 30 days. 
Will says he was also influenced by an invention called the Icy Ball that was actually first described in 1929. The Icy Ball used a similar chemical process, but it was extremely heavy, and Will's plan was to develop it into something that would be more comfortable to carry. Part of Will's preliminary research involved finding out how much someone who's not particularly strong can carry without difficulty. He discovered this to be 8 kilos, and so this was the weight he wanted his invention to have. The unit has a volume of 1.6 litres, and it is small enough in size to fit easily into a backpack. It's capable of transporting, for example, 2,000 doses of vaccine. The unit can be used for six days without any need for recharging. It goes without saying that the invention meets international safety standards. Will hopes that it may have many possible uses across the world. He sees it as being potentially invaluable, for example, for the safe transportation of supplies for use by nurses working in isolated tropical regions without the regular support of doctors. Will is so convinced of the need for his fridge that he is not motivated by any fame that might result from it and all profits go back into scientific research. He simply wants to do something that will have a positive effect on the lives of people who are living in difficult conditions. Now you will hear the talk again. This time in science, we've all had to choose an inventor or invention to do a project on. I decided to do mine about a prize-winning portable fridge that I'd heard mentioned on the radio. Then I went on the internet and discovered a lot more about the fridge and the person who invented it, 22-year-old Will Broadway. You might think that Will was motivated by the desire to keep drinks cool on sunny summer picnics, but that wasn't the case. His intention was to find a way of preventing medicines from getting too warm when they had to be transported in hot climates. It's been claimed that by making this possible, his invention could help to save the lives of 1.5 million people across the world. Will had just finished a degree in industrial design and technology. A study trip to Cambodia had made him aware of the difficulties that the heat caused. He saw people having to carry so much ice to keep things fresh when they needed to travel somewhere and decided that there had to be a better solution to the problem, but it was only when he was on holiday in Mexico that he came up with the actual invention. How does the device work? It is based on a process that was actually invented by Einstein in 1906. It involves heating a chemical called ammonia with water in one section of the fridge to create a gas which is then released into the main section when cooling is required. It can keep items at a steady temperature of between 2 and 8 degrees for up to 30 days. Will says he was also influenced by an invention called the Icy Ball that was actually first described in 1929. The Icy Ball used a similar chemical process, but it was extremely heavy and Will's plan was to develop it into something that would be more comfortable to carry. Part of Will's preliminary research involved finding out how much someone who's not particularly strong can carry without difficulty. He discovered this to be 8 kilos, and so this was the weight he wanted his invention to have. The unit has a volume of 1.6 litres, and it is small enough in size to fit easily into a backpack. It's capable of transporting, for example, 2,000 doses of vaccine. The unit can be used for six days without any need for recharging. It goes without saying that the invention meets international safety standards. Will hopes that it may have many possible uses across the world. He sees it as being potentially invaluable, for example, for the safe transportation of supplies for use by nurses working in isolated tropical regions without the regular support of doctors. Will is so convinced of the need for his fridge that he is not motivated by any fame that might result from it, and all profits go back into scientific research. He simply wants to do something that will have a positive effect on the lives of people 
who are living in difficult conditions. That is the end of the talk. In a moment you will hear exercise 3. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 3. You will hear six people talking about living in a big city. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list, A to G, which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1. I've lived in a big city all my life so far. I suppose it's noisy and crowded, but I'm so used to that that I don't really pay any attention to it. I go to a college just round the corner from our flat, so I don't have problems using rush hour transport. My parents both complain about the horrors of commuting. But I think we all enjoy the fact that there's a wide variety of nationalities living in our neighbourhood. There are at least ten in our block of flats. Speaker 2 We moved here from a village a few months ago and life's certainly very different. I can't say I miss nature and the fresh air that much. There are plenty of green spaces here too and an exciting variety of birds. I go to a large college here but actually I don't think the education was any worse where I was before. What I miss is just being able to pop round to a mate's house. No one I know lives anywhere near us but I'm gradually getting used to things. Speaker 3 I love city life. We have a roomy apartment looking across the river to the hills on the outskirts. There's so much you can do, something for every taste. And it's not true that you need to be rich to go out anywhere. There's lots of music and other shows you can enjoy without spending a fortune. Okay, some friends may live at the other end of a bus route, but that's not really a problem as there's far better public transport than in the countryside. I certainly wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Speaker 4 Cities are noisy places with crowds of people hurrying along, talking on their mobile phones rather than to the person next to them. I wouldn't say that aspect of city life appeals to me, but I know I'd never be able to take the courses I'm doing this year in a smaller place. That makes it well worth putting up with the less attractive bits of life here. And when it all gets too much, then I head to a lovely, peaceful park, five minutes walk from our home. Speaker 5 I'm a law student at a university in the capital, and I share a house with five friends. Sharing saves us money and we have fun together. It's a long journey to the campus, but I don't mind that too much. In fact, I get a lot of reading done when I'm travelling on the bus. Occasionally, though, I feel I just have to escape from the constant noise of city traffic. I'm just not used to that, having grown up in a small village. Speaker 6 we moved to the city because my mum got a job in an engineering college here. I was sorry to change schools, but I've made some good friends here now. 
We spend most of our spare time at each other's houses. My friends in the countryside wonder why we don't go to all the concerts, films and exhibitions that they think are available in the city. But the truth is that when you're at school, you just can't afford to go to that sort of thing. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 I've lived in a big city all my life so far. I suppose it's noisy and crowded, but I'm so used to that that I don't really pay any attention to it. I go to a college just round the corner from our flat, so I don't have problems using rush hour transport. My parents both complain about the horrors of commuting. But I think we all enjoy the fact that there's a wide variety of nationalities living in our neighbourhood. There are at least ten in our block of flats. Speaker 2 We moved here from a village a few months ago and life's certainly very different. I can't say I miss nature and the fresh air that much. There are plenty of green spaces here too and an exciting variety of birds. I go to a large college here, but actually I don't think the education was any worse where I was before. What I miss is just being able to pop round to a mate's house. No one I know lives anywhere near us, but I'm gradually getting used to things. Speaker 3 I love city life. We have a roomy apartment looking across the river to the hills on the outskirts. There's so much you can do, something for every taste. And it's not true that you need to be rich to go out anywhere. There's lots of music and other shows you can enjoy without spending a fortune. Okay, some friends may live at the other end of a bus route, but that's not really a problem as there's far better public transport than in the countryside. I certainly wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Speaker 4 Cities are noisy places with crowds of people hurrying along, talking on their mobile phones rather than to the person next to them. I wouldn't say that aspect of city life appeals to me, but I know I'd never be able to take the courses I'm doing this year in a smaller place. That makes it well worth putting up with the less attractive bits of life here. And when it all gets too much, then I head to a lovely, peaceful park, five minutes walk from our home. Speaker 5 I'm a law student at a university in the capital, and I share a house with five friends. Sharing saves us money and we have fun together. It's a long journey to the campus, but I don't mind that too much. In fact, I get a lot of reading done when I'm travelling on the bus. Occasionally, though, I feel I just have to escape from the constant noise of city traffic. I'm just not used to that, having grown up in a small village. Speaker 6 We moved to the city because my mum got a job in an engineering college here. I was sorry to change schools, but I've made some good friends here now. We spend most of our spare time at each other's houses. My friends in the countryside wonder why we don't go to all the concerts, films and exhibitions that they think are available in the city. But the truth is that when you're at school, you just can't afford to go to that sort of thing. That is the end of exercise 3. In a moment you will hear exercise 4. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam.
Exercise 4. You will hear an interview with a travel writer called Sandra Marshall. Listen to their conversation and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. Welcome to today's programme on Unusual Careers. I'm delighted to have with me Sandra Marshall, who writes travel articles for a range of newspapers, magazines and websites. Sandra, how did you get into this kind of work? By accident. I was in graduate school and an uncle, who was quite a successful author himself, proofread one of my assignments. It was on the history of railway development, I think. Afterwards, he told me he'd found my writing much better than he'd expected. He said I should write stuff that would reach a wider audience than boring essays. I sent an article to a travel magazine about a trip I'd recently made to a national park. It wasn't published, but they replied suggesting I write about a more unusual place I'd visited. What's your favourite destination? This is the question I'm always asked by people sitting next to me on airplanes or at parties and by my mother's friends. I'm very keen on Prague. It's a city with a fascinating history, of course, and it's incredibly lovely to look at, too. But my standard answer is Vietnam. It's hard to give a reason why. I just like the place and keep wanting to go back again and again. Do you think people make false assumptions about travel writers? Absolutely. Particularly when they imagine that you can do a story for a travel magazine just like that. Sometimes, of course, things magically happen, but a good article tends to need a lot of preparation. As a writer, you have to research where exactly to head for, who to set up interviews with, and you have to decide what could be an unusual approach to take to your subject. What's the most difficult aspect of being a travel writer? Well, at first, I missed not being part of a team, but I've got used to it now and accept that it's part of my life. But I'll never get accustomed to being turned down. It's really easy to let it bother you. I know, I've certainly done that. You just have to move on. You have to keep trying to resist any temptation to give up. What would you say is your greatest achievement? I was always told at school that I'd have to work hard to get into college, so I'd say managing to get a degree. Doing that even tops having a collection of my articles published by a major publishing house, which certainly was a personal accomplishment. That they were made into a television documentary was also quite special, of course. Is there anything you wish now that you'd done when you were younger? I certainly regret not taking more classes. One should never stop learning about writing. It can also help make you force yourself to write when perhaps you'd rather not bother. I think we can all learn from each other, and so putting yourself in any kind of learning environment is helpful. What tips would you give someone who'd like to become a travel writer? I realize this is a hard one, but it helps when you have a personal connection to the place. Editors love it when you offer them a story that's got that. It gives you an advantage over other people who are sending in stories about that place. So living abroad is really helpful. You end up with so much material and you gain a knowledge of the region that allows you to become an authority on the area. Not as good as if you were born there, but almost. So what are your plans for the coming year? Well, sometimes I feel like locking my suitcase and my passport away and staying at home, catching up on all the painting, repairing, and other jobs that need doing there. And in fact, I've been offered a full-time job in the journalism department of a local college. What I've actually decided to do is go and stay in a friend's beach house and experiment with writing a novel. It's a new venture for me, and I'm quite excited about the prospect. Sandra, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Now you will hear the interview again. Welcome to today's program on Unusual Careers. I'm delighted to have with me Sandra Marshall, who writes travel articles for a range of newspapers, magazines and websites. Sandra, how did you get into this kind of work? By accident. 
I was in graduate school and an uncle, who was quite a successful author himself, proofread one of my assignments. It was on the history of railway development, I think. Afterwards, he told me he'd found my writing much better than he'd expected. He said I should write stuff that would reach a wider audience than boring essays. I sent an article to a travel magazine about a trip I'd recently made to a national park. It wasn't published, but they replied suggesting I write about a more unusual place I'd visited. What's your favourite destination? This is the question I'm always asked by people sitting next to me on airplanes or at parties and by my mother's friends. I'm very keen on Prague. It's a city with a fascinating history, of course, and it's incredibly lovely to look at, too. But my standard answer is Vietnam. It's hard to give a reason why. I just like the place and keep wanting to go back again and again. Do you think people make false assumptions about travel writers? Absolutely. Particularly when they imagine that you can do a story for a travel magazine just like that. Sometimes, of course, things magically happen, but a good article tends to need a lot of preparation. As a writer, you have to research where exactly to head for, who to set up interviews with, and you have to decide what could be an unusual approach to take to your subject. What's the most difficult aspect of being a travel writer? Well, at first I missed not being part of a team, but I've got used to it now and accept that it's part of my life. But I'll never get accustomed to being turned down. It's really easy to let it bother you. I know, I've certainly done that. You just have to move on. You have to keep trying to resist any temptation to give up. What would you say is your greatest achievement? I was always told at school that I'd have to work hard to get into college, so I'd say managing to get a degree. Doing that even tops having a collection of my articles published by a major publishing house, which certainly was a personal accomplishment. That they were made into a television documentary was also quite special, of course. Is there anything you wish now that you'd done when you were younger? I certainly regret not taking more classes. One should never stop learning about writing. It can also help make you force yourself to write when perhaps you'd rather not bother. I think we can all learn from each other, and so putting yourself in any kind of learning environment is helpful. What tips would you give someone who'd like to become a travel writer? I realize this is a hard one, but it helps when you have a personal connection to the place. Editors love it when you offer them a story that's got that. It gives you an advantage over other people who are sending in stories about that place. So living abroad is really helpful. You end up with so much material and you gain a knowledge of the region that allows you to become an authority on the area. Not as good as if you were born there, but almost. So what are your plans for the coming year? Well, sometimes I feel like locking my suitcase and my passport away and staying at home, catching up on all the painting, repairing, and other jobs that need doing there. And in fact, I've been offered a full-time job in the journalism department of a local college. What I've actually decided to do is go and stay in a friend's beach house and experiment with writing a novel. It's a new venture for me, and I'm quite excited about the prospect. Sandra, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. That is the end of the interview. In a moment you will hear exercise 5. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 5. Part A. You will hear a man giving a talk about humpback whales. Listen to the talk 
and complete the notes in part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Humpback whales spend several months of each year in Arctic or Antarctic waters. However, every winter, hundreds of these whales migrate long distances to warmer tropical regions where they breed and give birth. The newborn baby humpbacks rely on an incredible milk consumption of up to 239 litres every day. This enables them to gain the body fat that they need in only a few months, so that they'll be able to survive the long journey back to cooler waters in summer. For a long time, scientists have wanted to learn more about how vulnerable whale babies manage to stay safe from predators during the early months of their lives. Not surprisingly, humans are one source of danger with their use of fishing nets and ropes, not to mention the pollution they cause. It's becoming increasingly apparent, though, that other whales and sharks pose more of a risk to baby humpbacks. As well as this, scientists want to learn about the ways in which the babies communicate with their mothers. Up until now, it has proved hard to find out about the early life stages of wild whales, because they're an aquatic animal and it's virtually impossible to keep them under observation. Researchers from an Australian university have managed to complete some particularly fascinating work. They found a clever way of tracking eight baby humpbacks and two mothers. Initially, they planned to use underwater cameras to monitor what the whales were doing, but it was decided that would be impractical. They eventually developed sound recorders, which enabled them to collect some interesting information. The researchers were unprepared for what their findings revealed. They found out that, unlike human babies who often cry or scream, baby humpbacks signal their hunger by making noises similar to whispers. While an adult whale song can be heard over an area covering several kilometres, the whales in the study could only hear each other within a distance of less than a hundred metres. As the water is often dark, the mothers and their young have to swim close together to ensure they are travelling in the same direction. Mothers often touch their young with what appear to be signs of affection, and they are often seen leaping right out of the water, though the reasons for this are still unknown. Understanding whale behaviour is essential to the future conservation projects aimed at protecting this fascinating species. Now you will hear the talk again. Humpback whales spend several months of each year in Arctic or Antarctic waters. However, every winter, hundreds of these whales migrate long distances to warmer tropical regions where they breed and give birth. The newborn baby humpbacks rely on an incredible milk consumption of up to 239 litres every day. This enables them to gain the body fat that they need in only a few months, so that they'll be able to survive the long journey back to cooler waters in summer. For a long time, scientists have wanted to learn more about how vulnerable whale babies manage to stay safe from predators during the early months of their lives. Not surprisingly, humans are one source of danger with their use of fishing nets and ropes, not to mention the pollution they cause. It's becoming increasingly apparent, though, that other whales and sharks pose more of a risk to baby humpbacks. As well as this, scientists want to learn about the ways in which the babies communicate with their mothers. Up until now, it has proved hard to find out about the early life stages of wild whales because they're an aquatic animal and it's virtually impossible to keep them under observation. Researchers from an Australian university have managed to complete some particularly fascinating work. They found a clever way of tracking eight baby humpbacks and two mothers. Initially, they planned to use underwater cameras to monitor what the whales were doing, but it was decided that would be impractical. 
They eventually developed sound recorders, which enabled them to collect some interesting information. The researchers were unprepared for what their findings revealed. They found out that, unlike human babies who often cry or scream, baby humpbacks signal their hunger by making noises similar to whispers. While an adult whale song can be heard over an area covering several kilometres, the whales in the study could only hear each other within a distance of less than a hundred metres. As the water is often dark, the mothers and their young have to swim close together to ensure they are travelling in the same direction. Mothers often touch their young with what appear to be signs of affection, and they are often seen leaping right out of the water, though the reasons for this are still unknown. Understanding whale behaviour is essential to the future conservation projects aimed at protecting this fascinating species. Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students about humpback whales and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one word only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. That talk about humpback whales was fascinating, wasn't it? It made me want to find out more. Me too. I looked them up online and found out about some other bits of research that have been done on them recently. So did I. What did you discover? Well, the first website I found was discussing the speed at which they travel. But then I found a fascinating and more detailed report on a study done into the seasonal migration patterns of the whales. The researchers were curious to learn why humpback whales migrate such a long distance. They knew that this could be further than any other mammal. And what was their conclusion? They discovered that the whales like to end up in waters with a temperature of 21 to 29 degrees regardless of latitude. They believe that warmer waters have a positive impact on the development of the whale's young. But they're not sure yet whether this is because feeding there is easier or for some quite different reason. Interesting. So what did you learn? Uh, well, I read a really interesting article where researchers had managed to do some underwater photography of a male and a female whale moving around each other in a particular way. Really? Yes, they were doing something that resembled dancing. They were slapping each other from time to time with their tails, but it looked friendly rather than like fighting. The scientists think this may be something that the whales do before mating. They want to discover whether that is the case, and if so, then they will press for there to be restrictions on boat traffic in areas where this is occurring in order to allow mating to take place undisturbed. Well, anything that helps the species to be preserved would be a good thing. Absolutely. I saw another piece of research reported online about whales. It was focusing on the so-called music that different whales make analysing their patterns rather than measuring the levels or trying to work out the purpose of their songs. They discovered that, compared with other whales, the humpback produces the most complex songs. How amazing! Yes. I didn't see anything about whether their songs change each year, but I was amazed to learn that they vary with where the creatures are. It seems that, although humpbacks everywhere construct their songs in a similar way, all oceans feature songs that differ from those recorded elsewhere. Extraordinary! Now you will hear the conversation again. That talk about humpback whales was fascinating, wasn't it? It made me want to find out more. Me too. I looked them up online and found out about some other bits of research that have been done on them recently. So did I. What did you discover? Well, the first website I found was discussing the speed at which they travel. 
But then I found a fascinating and more detailed report on a study done into the seasonal migration patterns of the whales. The researchers were curious to learn why humpback whales migrate such a long distance. They knew that this could be further than any other mammal. And what was their conclusion? They discovered that the whales like to end up in waters with a temperature of 21 to 29 degrees regardless of latitude. They believe that warmer waters have a positive impact on the development of the whale's young. But they're not sure yet whether this is because feeding there is easier or for some quite different reason. Interesting. So what did you learn? Uh, well, I read a really interesting article where researchers had managed to do some underwater photography of a male and a female whale moving around each other in a particular way. Really? Yes, they were doing something that resembled dancing. They were slapping each other from time to time with their tails, but it looked friendly rather than like fighting. The scientists think this may be something that the whales do before mating. They want to discover whether that is the case, and if so, then they will press for there to be restrictions on boat traffic in areas where this is occurring in order to allow mating to take place undisturbed. Well, anything that helps the species to be preserved would be a good thing. Absolutely. I saw another piece of research reported online about whales. It was focusing on the so-called music that different whales make analysing their patterns rather than measuring the levels or trying to work out the purpose of their songs. They discovered that, compared with other whales, the humpback produces the most complex songs. How amazing! Yes. I didn't see anything about whether their songs change each year, but I was amazed to learn that they vary with where the creatures are. It seems that although humpbacks everywhere construct their songs in a similar way, all oceans feature songs that differ from those recorded elsewhere. Extraordinary. That is the end of exercise 5.